Yeah, the Hawaii Clean Energy uh, Initiative, 13 years later, uh, Marco Mangelsdorf and I get together to take a look back. It's a retrospective. It's even nostalgic, but it's also a statement of where we are today and, and looking at the years between, um, you know, then and now, and now in the future, making some reasonable, hmm, logical, objective predictions as to whether we could go where we want to go um, with due regard for where we have been. Good morning, Marco. Nice to see you. My dear friend, Jay, I'm getting a, a small frisson, which is French for a little shiver in the back of my, my neck there with the great anticipation, knowing that we're going to be going where no Toto or Dorothy has gone before. I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> P.S. We were never in Kansas. Actually, my, <laughs> my family my family hails from Kansas, so, you know, no anti Kansas jokes here, okay? No, 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 no. <laughs> so we're talking about the Clean Energy Initiative. Can you remember and can you describe what that was all about in 2008? You know, the world was different then. You know, George Bush was the president. Uh, we were heavily engaged in the Middle East. Um, the country uh, had a terrible time with the economy, if you remember. Um, and we had the Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative under Governor Linda Lingle. Okay, is that enough of an environmental description? Go for it. It is, it is. So let me kind of give a little bit of uh, explanation as to the genesis of coming up with today's uh, discussion topic, Jay. So as uh, you are very well aware, uh, our friends at Hawaiian Electric over the past couple of weeks have been very vocal in uh, what they say they're going to uh, accomplish or we're gonna accomplish, they're gonna accomplish, we're all gonna accomplish across their service territories in nine years or by nine years from now, 2030, right? You had Shannon from HECO on last week who spoke to you, which I'm very appreciative of. And I got to thinking, you know, as we hear yet again about uh, things that we hope to see happen, they hope to see happen uh, years from now, I got to thinking, huh, hmm, maybe it would be useful to kind of do a little retrospective on what people were saying 13 plus years ago about all the wonderful things all the wonderful opportunities we have here in Hawaii for renewable energy, becoming more independent, energy-wise, cleaner energy-wise. So I decided to, to dust off my copy here, which I will show to the screen here, which I've been keeping. It says the Hawaii DOE Clean Energy. So this was in March of, of uh, 2008, and it led to this HCEI, Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative, being signed if I'm uh, memory correct, in October 2008, uh, you were in the room. Uh, there was, was Governor Linda Lingle was there. HEI Chair Connie Lau was there. There was uh, a representative from the U.S. Department of Energy, and it Bill could Park. have been Bill, Bill Park, Bill, yeah. who was there. And, uh, and, and the, uh, uh, the uh, invite, invited uh, uh, people, the honorees, to come and witness this. And uh, they the, came up the with consumer this. protector was there. Consumer protector was there. Uh, but I believe you know, the PUC was there. All the people who needed to be there, Jay, were there. Well, I wasn't there, but I'm glad you were there. So I decided to go back and look at uh, what was put down on paper and what was supposedly agreed to uh, back 13 plus years ago. And uh, it's just an interesting. Uh, to, to look at the aspirations and the stated goals back then and see, okay, 13 years later, how are we doing? How are we doing 13 years later with actually making progress towards these aspirational goals? So that was, that's the, the genesis of why I proposed we do this show today on uh, the 13 year retrospective of HCI. So now I'm of course very interested to hear what the vibe was like in the room because you were there. Well, let me, let me go back a little bit, you know, um, there was the um, tech initiative and really think tech was all about that. There was act 20, 221 back in the, uh, in the first uh, decade of the century. Um, and um, there was, there was hopefulness in the air about developing a, a tech economy. And a lot of uh, young people who had uh, been exposed to the tech economy in, uh, in Silicon Valley had come back. They, they had returned to Hawaii thinking that uh, Act 221 was gonna make it possible. 
um, programmers, entrepreneurs, you know, all kinds of smart local people uh, were, were back to try that. And um, unfortunately, Linda Lingle, one of her initial initiatives, and it lasted throughout her two terms in office, was to bust 221. She wanted to destroy it. And ultimately, she destroyed it. She, she caused it to be repealed, advocated for that, um, even before its sunset date. Um, and her replacement for 221, a political thing, uh, was in her second term, which began, what, 2006, went from 2006, 2010, was the innovation economy. She just replaced the word technology with innovation. Um, and she advocated for that. It was, it was the same in substance, um, except that she didn't want 221 involved. She didn't want to encourage investment um, but she did want to have an innovation economy, and, and she expanded the notion of technology and innovation. Um, regrettably, it never went anywhere, but it had a very deleterious effect on the people who wanted to see a, a technology uh, economy. So that's another environmental thing to look at in the year 2008, that Linda Lingle was actively advocating for her new second term initiative called the innovation economy. And that appears um, in that meeting. It appears in the notes for that meeting. It was the announcement, that meeting essentially was the announcement of a multi-party agreement to seek clean energy for the state of Hawaii. Everyone was on board, um, but in fact, and it was like, you know, it was like over a hundred pages long. I'm not kidding, it was quite lengthy. But somebody said, and I, and I have to, looking back, I would have to agree that this was only an agreement to agree um, because what, what could you do except state an aspirational goal, you know? And a statement of cooperation by all the parties. There were expectations of each of the parties. Um, I, I wish I, I could remember or, or had the, um, you know, the paperwork um, to revisit those those particular aspirations, particular expectations for each of the parties to the agreement. And there were several government agencies involved um, and, um, and see how those aspirations and expectations have been realized so far. Uh, that's, that's really an interesting question. And that, that's the question we hear about today, Marco. Let me ask you, I mean, your perception is, um, we, we had just kind of invented this whole thing about a clean energy initiative. This agreement was to advance that initiative. This agreement was to confirm, solidify, memorialize, uh, and go forward you know, to, to new heights with that initiative. It was to formalize the notion that had been discussed. But query, how far have we gotten between, what, 2008 and now? Well, that's a great set of questions there, Jay, because there are five bullet points here, which I think are worth going over in some detail uh, from this document to just kind of scroll back briefly. So, you know, the state of Hawaii has been an innovator and a, a substantial supporter of renewable energy going back to at least, I'm going to say 1977, 78, uh, with the first, one of the first of the nations, along with California, a uh, state tax credit to promote solar. Now, back then, solar, of course, meant solar water heating of some kinds, this photovoltaic really didn't take off until mm, 2007, 2008 here in the state. But I mean, the Hawaii to its credit has been a out front supporter of renewable energy, understandably so, because we're so dependent on long supply lines of energy, uh, fossil fuels coming this way. So uh, the, first, the first bullet point here, this page, by the way, starts with Hawaii presents unique opportunities, both immediate both immediate and long-term for energy sector transformation. Fully agree, unique opportunities are there for energy sector transformation. So the first bullet point here under that heading, the state has abundant local renewable resources, including wind, sun, sun wind, geothermal, comma, et cetera. Sun, wind, geothermal, geothermal, comma, et cetera. So I thought, well, let's look at each of those Three, the et cetera, well, that's kind of ambiguous. So I guess I'll leave that aside. 
But sun, what, so what, what have we done with the sun resource out here since over the past 13 years? Uh, I can make two observations. One is that rooftop solar, behind the meter solar, and now behind the meter solar and storage has done very, very well, very well. Where we have the largest percentage of homes, single family homes in the country on a percentage basis have solar electric systems. And that's, that's true, truly an accomplishment on our part. And that is due to the hard work of contractors like my company and many, many others, as well as support of the legislature, support in the Public Utilities Commission, support from uh, Hawaiian Electric companies, uh, KIUC as well. So rooftop solar, I would give an A. Uh, utilities- but You would have to solar. add to that. That, um, that where it started with local investment, local companies, local rooftop solar installers, over that period of 13 years, a lot of money and companies flowed in to the state of Hawaii, where it is not nearly so much of a local phenomenon now as it is uh, investment by mainland companies. Am I right? Well, you bring up a good point. It's been a balance of both mainland companies like Sunrun, uh, what was then a, a company called Solar City, which morphed into Tesla, uh, Vivint Solar, a number of others. So it's been both a mix of local, locally grown, locally run, locally operated and owned companies and mainland companies. And in terms of the mix, I, and I don't have a percentage in my mind, but it's been, it's been substantial uh, on both sides. So both local and mainland. Uh, to follow up on the solar end of it, so behind the meter, solar, rooftop solar, A. Give it a grade as an A. Utility scale solar, very little so far. There's uh, a lot that's on the books. There's a lot that's being planned. But in terms of actual utility scale solar uh, across the islands, that's still rarely Manini. So I would give a, a much lesser grade for utility scale solar at this time in terms of actual on the ground operational projects. Let's move to wind. What's happened wind wise? Uh, well, the wind has blown you know, pretty much regularly for the past 13 plus years. Are there any new wind farms anywhere? No, zero, as far as I know, zero. I remember the, um, you know, all the excitement over first wind in Maui on, on the, the top of the mountains there. There was an awful lot of talk about that. And, um, and then there was a, remember there was a second increment. Um, I think there was a different investment structure, but a second increment right down the hill from the first wind original. And people were very excited about wind. However, um, little by little, it ran into the NIMBY problem. And um, I think that that had a big effect on the, you know, the ability of entrepreneurs to, to build wind. There's Ulapalakua in Maui also developed wind. Uh, I think they have a, a substantial uh, wind farm um, in the ranch. And I guess the saving grace there is it's the ranch. And um, the, the ranch wasn't going to complain about its own project. Um, and it was also very remote. Ulupalakua, you can quote me on this, Marco. Ulupalakua is remote. And um, the, there, were, there were some small towns in the area, but they were all mm, brought into the fold, so to speak. So nobody was complaining. There was no NIMBY in Ulapalakua. Uh, aside from that, which I think that took place right around 2008. Aside from that, oh, and of course, we have the wind on the North Shore of Oahu, um, a number of places where local communities at first said, hey, that's good. Um, we're, we're on board. And they came and spoke at the, at the, you know, the groundbreakings and the, and the completion ceremonies and all. <clears throat> but um, over time, um, I think they've kind of separated from that point of view, and there's been a fair amount of NIMBY over the wind on the North Shore, so much so that um, I think developers would be reluctant to put more in. And well, finally, <clears throat> there's uh, Ted Pex, who used to be the state energy officer, um, before uh, Neil Abercrombie, as I remember. Uh, he, uh, he, he supports and is working, was working on offshore wind uh, off the south coast of Oahu. Uh, and it's a very interesting project, which hasn't gone anywhere. 
And although, you know, there are people who say, no, 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 there's really no problem. Um, this is as good as it is in the, uh, in the North Sea, where there is a tremendous amount of offshore wind. Um, people are not going to object to this. Uh, I don't think it's gotten off the ground in any way. And um, there are those who say it will never get off the ground. Um, so anyway, I think wind, as you say, wind has, uh, has become static. Well, and thank you for uh, for reminding me, Jay. I'm um, embarrassed to say, uh, well, not embarrassed, but I'm correcting myself that, yes, you reminded me that uh, since 2008, there is new wind generation that, as you noted correctly, on uh, North Shore of Oahu that has gone online or will go online. And that, as you note, uh, terrestrial or land-based wind seems to uh, be not in the cards these days, and others have been looking at offshore wind as a possibility, which would be, uh, you know, big question mark in terms of whether that comes to fruition. So I think in terms of wind development over the past 13 years, we'd have to give uh, you know a grade of a, of a D or a C at the best, right? Very little new wind generation has come online. It's and the too last bad, one, by the way, I'd like to offer that thought. It's too bad because back in 2008, wind was a player. Everyone thought wind ought to be in, in a diversified portfolio, um, but it didn't, it, it didn't work out that way because uh, and people, people didn't like having it near them. And that, that wrecks projects, you know, yeah. in Hawaii. So moving to the next uh, uh, wind energy source here, geothermal. So what's up with geothermal? What's gone on with geothermal in the past 13 years? Is there any new developments in terms of geothermal? Well, we had a, an active volcanic eruption here, 2018, that took out PGV for quite a while. Now they're back up and running somewhere over 20, around 25 megawatts working their way up to 30 plus. Uh, there's a revised and amended power purchase agreement that would allow PGV and ORMAT to go up to close to 50 megawatts of generation at a fixed price for the entire production of PGV that will be taken up, I believe, uh, in the months to come uh, by the Public Utilities Commission. And But other than PGV, uh, there's no, as far as I know, no other geothermal, uh, serious geothermal, plans or inklings uh, anywhere else on this island, anywhere else in the state. So, you know, geothermal, again, you know, the potential is there. We love to talk about potential, but in terms of actual plans to go beyond what PGV could conceivably get to in the high 40s as far as megawatts, there's nothing that I know of this in the cards. And geothermal, you know, when it comes to drilling down into Madame Pele is anything but uh, uh, you know, a slam dunk in terms of getting local uh, and environmental buy-in for that. So uh, let me, let me add a little bit to what you're saying. Yeah, uh, and that is um, <clears throat> since 2008, uh, geothermal really hasn't gone anywhere. Uh, there was talk about you know years back, right around that time actually, uh, geothermal had hundreds of years to go, thousands of years uh, to produce dispatchable energy to the state. Um, possibilities, and I think these are still in consideration of converting that to hydrogen and moving the hydrogen around the state. Uh, I don't think that's come to fruition yet, uh, or, or will it? Um, and then, of course, uh, there's the cultural argument, fight, uh, controversy about Madame Pele, which actually brought the uh, geothermal plant down for a while in the 90s. So lawsuit and an injunction and all that. And they gave up for a while and sold it to ORMAT. Uh, and ORMAT, ORMAT um, you know, continued it. Uh, but there still is the cultural ceiling, if you will. It's capable of far more than, what, 38 megawatts or 40 megawatts. It's capable of multiples of that. Um, but the cultural ceiling stops it. It's a kind of a, an unspoken truce. If you don't try to build more of it, we'll, we'll, we'll let it go. If you do, we'll be, we'll be yeah. complaining. Yeah. And then finally, there's all the talk that's happened over the years, you know, then and since then, about the existence of other geothermal facility, other ge geothermal resources uh, in other parts of the Big Island, and for that matter, even Maui. And Mililani Trask wanted to have uh, a Native Hawaiian company um, you know, um, um, develop those resources. And she even went to the legislature about it, um, but it never happened. She was asking for special consideration that the legislature wasn't willing to give her. Um, bottom line is that that whole idea 
the, the one advanced by Miliani Trask got stopped or it never went anywhere. So here we are 13 years later, and it's still the same, um, you know, Pune Geothermal Venture. Uh, and just to kind of as a sidebar note to that, because I was crunching the numbers, uh, recently Hawaiian Electric updated their very useful spreadsheet showing what the renewable uh, the renewable production has been for their three, uh, their three utility companies here. And they just posted numbers for Q2, Q2 of this year. And by my extrapolation, if and when PGV were to go up to close to 50 megawatts of output, that would push Hawaii Electric Light Company, AKA Helco, into well into the 70% plus range in terms of our electric power generation in terms of RPS renewable portfolio standard. So we would, we're, we would be duking it out essentially with KIUC, especially if KIUC gets their pumped hydro online, it would be Kauai and, and Hawaii Island that would be the two leaders in terms of renewable energy uh, for power generation. So, and this is not, you know, decades from now, this is uh, several years from now. So I'm hopeful you know that we'll be able to lead the state in that so let me go to the next bullet point here one more point about that marco is this is um you know that eruption a couple of years ago it's troubling it's <laughs> troubling to anyone because it could happen again and if you rely on a Puna geothermal venture um, you have that risk at all times going forward so you have to have a plan b if you want to rely on geothermal point taken Point taken. Well, I'll remind you, my friend, that uh, the plan is to also get online uh, a substantial amount of solar megawatts and, and megawatt hours worth of storage, and that is well underway here on this island. So let me go on to the next the bullet point here in this document. Hawaii pays the highest electricity costs in the nation and among the highest transportation costs in the nation. Let's reread that. We pay the highest electricity costs in the nation and the highest transportation fuel costs in the nation. So let's look at that 13 years later. Have we made any progress in terms of lowering our electric costs to be less the highest in the nation? And the answer to that is no. For example, right now on Lanai, they are pushing close to 50 cents, 50 zero, 50 cents a kilowatt hour, residential. On uh, this island, uh, this past, this month, the highest tier, the highest tier, the, the most costly tier for residential is now 40 cents a kilowatt hour. So, and Oahu is now mid thirties. So we are still by a factor of at least three X higher, three X higher than the average cost on the mainland. So I, I think we can safely say that we have made very little to no progress in terms of lowering uh, or, or reducing that ratio, right? What about transportation fuel costs? Well, I hear California is actually the highest in the, in the nation right now. They're pushing six bucks a gallon. We're not too far behind. So I think it's safe to say that we're still amongst the highest transportation fuel costs in the nation. And we will, as long as we continue to be so dependent on these long supply lines of petroleum coming into the state. So we can't give very good, very good grades for reducing high electric costs, nor can we give good, very good grades for the high cost of transportation fuels. Well, let me add something that uh, springs off uh, 60 Minutes yesterday. <clears throat> the first segment on 60 Minutes had to do with what is wrong ex exactly with our supply lines. And they, uh, it was a very good piece because it's not clear. And uh, they ultimately concluded that there were a lot of things wrong and uh, we're all feeding into a huge and growing problem, um, which itself feeds into uh, the cost of transportation for the whole country to transport goods coming and going. And that means, guess what, Marco, you're sitting down? <clears throat> that means higher transportation costs lead to higher prices in general. It's yeah. inflation, okay? Now, if the state of Hawaii continues to be dependent in any substantial way, any sub substantial way on the, on the shipment of oil into the state, um, we are going to be subject to those very same elusive supply line problems that this segment was talking about. And that will be visited in higher costs for a kilowatt hour, right? Oh, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And I get that. again, my main takeaway here is that in terms of reducing this high electric cost, uh, reducing the, the uh, cost of transportation fuels, not much, not much progress, uh, if any, really has been made over the past 13 years. Let's, let me move to the next bullet point here. 
Uh, and just as a kind of an intro, you remember um, a good dude by the name of Captain Ahab in Herman uh, Melville's Moby Dick? Of course. And you know his obsession with the great white whale? Yes. So with that lead, we have long had an obsession towards going after, quote, unexploited opportunities for efficiency. We love to talk about all these untapped areas where we can create megawatts, not megawatts, but megawatts, where we are essentially cleaning up our act as far as using less energy, right? Greater efficiency. Now, I don't have that data in front of me, and, and I'm not even sure what the metrics are, but I mean, there are metrics out there, but I haven't looked at it prior to the show here. But my guess is that here in Hawaii, in terms of efficiency, probably haven't made all that much progress in the past 13 years. Why? Because despite the cost of energy being as high as it is, relatively speaking, to the mainland, it's still not that super high that really drives all that much in terms of incentives to really up, up, up our game as far as energy efficiency. That's, that's my, my point. I'm sticking to it. And I would add about the frog, you know, the frog, the frog in the water. I mean, if, if it was a, a, a grand increase all at once, the frog would drop, you know, would jump out of the water. But gradual increases or the perpetuation of um, troubling, you know, incremental increases, um, the frog stays in the water. And guess what? It gets to be frog soup. Uh, and and, that, and the, I think that that process is happening. People, people somehow are willing to pay the extra freight. Um, and so they don't particularly get concerned about efficiency. So point four here, oil provides, this is again, 13 years ago, oil provides approximately 85% of the state's energy, leaving Hawaii vulnerable, vulnerable to supply disruptions and energy insecurity. What's key here? 85% energy security supply disruption. Are we any more secure energy-wise as far as the, the, uh, the threat of of supply disruptions, hard to make much of a case that I, I don't feel much more secure. I don't think a lot of people feel much more secure. And importantly, my I haven't looked at the DBED numbers uh, for a while, but I believe the state of Hawaii is still somewhere in the 80, 80 plus range percent, 80 plus percent range as far as dependent on imported oil coming into the state for the total net consumption of energy here in the state. We're still in the 80% range. So 13 years ago, they said 85%. Now we're down a little bit to 80%. Have we made progress? Well, numerically, yes, absolutely we have. Uh, is it as fast enough as we want? Hell no. Yeah, and as I mentioned, as we discussed, you pointed out a minute ago, is that, is that the um, is that oil, oil uh, market is subject to all kinds of geopolitical events. Um, and if if we have no control over the price, and we don't, not over the long term, we don't. Uh, therefore, that, you know that detracts from any notion of energy security. Uh, you know, if, if we can get the oil at all, you know, going forward in an unstable world, seems like it's becoming more unstable all the time. I Here's want to add one more point to that. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Oh, just kind of apropos to supply disruption. I read over the weekend. There is a record, Jay, record 81 container ships off the coast of California ports waiting for a slot to come in and offload. 81 container ships. Yeah, they've been waiting weeks, even yeah. months. Multiply, that was in the 60 minutes segment. Which, you know, the equivalent if you do 80 towards, I think, an average cargo container ship is somewhere in the 10,000 plus range as far as containers. So 80 times 10,000. Now you're starting to get into real numbers, right? So the, this, the, I mean, one of the things that really scares me, my friend, is the disruption of our supply lines, both for energy and then food, energy and then food, or food first and then energy, but both, you know, they're both critically important. So we're still very, very insecure uh, in terms of this, this addiction that we have to imported fossil fuels to run our state. I, I wanted to follow up on that exact point. And that is this, in, in a time of uh, climate change, and if it isn't clear now, it, it will be, uh, climate change generates uh, extreme weather. And the extreme weather, you know, could take our towers down, uh, telephone poles with power lines, 
take them down and um swamp the harbors swamp the harbors and right and make and make bringing sure disrupt the supply lines big time extreme weather climate change will disrupt the the supply lines including food goods and merchandise in general and of course um you know energy and so if the power lines come down or the system the grid is is disrupted um and plus we we have a problem in the, the you know the generation side of things for the lack of this fuel even if it isn't 80 percent, even if it's 75 percent, even if it's 70 percent, this is going to be a problem and, and climate change aside from the geopolitical events that could um you know disrupt the supply lines um, climate change could disrupt the supply lines and query you know whether there's anything we have done uh, to make that stronger make them more resilient um, and the answer is only one thing and it goes back to the very beginning of this discussion and that is um, having more rooftop solar for individual owners and batteries for individual owners but that's not for the community in general so it's a, it's a solution only for a few, not for the many, um, and and that would that would help, but it as you say, it's not enough. So last point here as we kind of wrap things up. Uh, quote: Each island is an isolated microgrid, providing an opportunity to focus on the whole system. I'll repeat: Each island is an isolated microgrid, providing an opportunity to focus on the whole system. I'm not really sure what they mean by that, what was meant by this, but my take is that this was envisioning connecting the islands over oh, time. Absolutely. Having, yeah. This okay. was this was a big discussion in the room in 2008. It was going to be the undersea cable um, connecting Oahu, which needed the resource, didn't have it, uh, and Maui. And there was a big question mark about the big island. Uh, I think the, uh, the, the view of it then was that we can't do it yet. The technology is not there with the cable. Expensive. Um, but someday, well, it was more than that. It was the depth of that channel yeah. was so great that the cable laying ships didn't have the ability to lay the cable in a way that it wouldn't break in the process of being laid. This was a big problem. Anyway, it was gonna be uh, Lanai, I suppose uh, maybe Molokai. Yeah, um, it was you know those islands in in four Island. County versus four islands. Yeah, four islands. Yeah, <laughs> it was a big deal. Everybody talking about it, <clears throat> and um, and it it died a horrible death um, because of um, you know activists on on um, I guess I guess it was on Lanai Molokai uh, as well and, Molokai and Molokai. Well. Okay, and you know uh, we supported it. Abercrombie supported it. But he really didn't go far enough to make it happen. And after a while, the government, you know, in the face of all this objection, they faded and it stopped. And a whole undersea cable. And by the way, plenty of money was spent in, you know, in surveys and the like and in research about the path of the cable. Um, but it faded and that was the end of that. And it hasn't been um, discussed again in several, in many years. And the tragedy is that I don't think people really understood the point here in what you're reading and the benefit to the state you know the state has migrated away from being an island state to a state of islands and i, I think it was a big thing back around that time where every island had its own personality and you had to let every island every county develop its own personality and it was okay if it wasn't like the other personalities and that has in my view now you may not agree but in my view that took a toll on the you know statewide integrity of things like this it would be it would have been so great to have this uh, you know this uh, cable uh, am I, they were even opposing wind, remember? In, in the Garden of the Gods in West uh, Lanai, big fight about that, and even to have wind. And they said, oh, <clears throat> it will ruin our lives in Lanai City. You couldn't even see it in Lanai City. Anyway, my point is that the activists were very active in that period, and they stopped all these projects, including undersea cable. 
Well, I would imagine, Jay, if Senators uh, Maisie Hirono and Brian Schatz, great folks, great folks who are representing Hawaii along with Ed Case, and uh, who am I forgetting? Uh, who's the other rep? Oh, shame on me. Help me out here. Oh, Ed Case and who's the other? Oh, my, how could I forget? My friend Kai Kahele. Shame on yeah. me. He's a big guy. Kahele, like right. Can't, can't, can't forget Kai. You know, they're all doing a great job representing Hawaii. I mean, if those four could pull a magic trick and get three, four, five billion dollars, you know, kind of strings, no strings attached to do inter island cable, you know, I think we could probably make a lot of progress. But, you know, the days of Danny Akaka, or excuse me, missing my, mixing my Danny's, Danny Akaka was a great guy. Daniel Lenoe, you know, who was quite the patron saint of good causes in Hawaii. You know, but there's no Danny Anoy anymore in the Senate and the days of getting two, three, four billion kind of in uh, the, the strings, no strings attached money for something like underwater cable, probably not going to happen anytime in the near future. So, yeah, yeah well, I, I, but there's still there's still a public problem, a public opinion problem where people say, you want me to despoil my environment here on Maui, uh, Lanai or Molokai in order to help the people in Oahu, yeah, huh, take a walk. I'm not I, I interested in that. I couldn't agree more. You're you're absolutely right. Uh, not going to happen. So, uh, I mean, again, to kind of tie this all up with a, a bow, a nice bow, pretty or otherwise. You know, it's just so interesting too. And I, I, I feel like I've maybe come across as too much of a uh, grump, grumpy Marco today or Cassandra in terms of uh, poo-pooing the uh, progress we have made because we have made progress. It just is to me uh, woefully inadequate in retrospect. So now again, we have these aspirational goals, 2045, 100% renewable and power generation. How many years away is that? 24 years, 2030. Wine Electric is saying, uh, wants to cut emissions by 70%, as you pointed out talking to Shannon, you know, we're already on our way to that. Uh, they wanna add another 50,000 rooftop solar on top of the existing 90,000. Well, how can I not support that? I mean, all these are great aspirational goals. Uh, I'm just, uh, you know, also focused on uh, what's going on in the trenches right now, trying to get systems in. We have an epically challenged permitting system now on the Big Island that has been a, uh, a slow-moving train wreck over the past several months, and that's in, in, in hindering my ability to install systems and everybody's ability to install systems. So, the, so there's the words and the aspirations up here, and the press releases and the high polluting sounding words. And then there's the reality in the trenches, which can often be something rather different. Well, let me offer this to make you feel better. Thank you. Um, the alternative to not having aspirations is much worse. Um, so I, I have to uh, compliment uh, whoever is involved in, in looking at this and finding aspirations and talking about it publicly. If Hawaiian Electric uh, believes this can be done, if the State Energy Office believes this can be done, all the power to them. That's that's a pun, you know. All the power to them. Um, and and it's our job. It's the public's job and the media's job and and our job, Marco, to you know remind them of the aspirations and to track and connect the dots on the aspirations. Because you know one of the things that is inherent in ex expressing, announcing these aspirations is the notion that it will affect public opinion and the public will remember it and get on board. So <clears throat> let's get on board. Let's, um, let's follow, follow the dots, connect the dots, and uh, let's, let's comment on it going forward. What do you think? From aspirations to words of Jay Fidel, inspirations, I'm, I'm left speechless and almost close to tears, but not quite. <laughs> Thank you, Marco. Always, always good to talk with you. I really appreciate you coming on and, <clears throat> and having these conversations. Thank you, my friend. Always a great pleasure. Aloha.